Hello and welcome to The Bestseller Experiment, where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark DeVoe. And I'm Mark Stay, And as always, a huge thanks to anyone who helps keep this show on the road. And that includes our bestseller academates and our patrons over on Patreon. And we have a new patron this week. It's Lucy Farfort. Lucy, thank you so much for helping this, helping us stay on the air and get the good word out there. So uh, if you want to be like Lucy, pop over to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support. You can discover all the good stuff you got on Patreon over there and click loads of deep dives. But also check out the Academy as well, academy.com bestsellerexperiment.com. Mr. D, how are you, sir? I am doing great, Mr. State. How's life? Really good. Uh, finished uh, an edit on a book, sent it out to some beta readers, so I'm sitting here quietly terrified. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always it. always a good it. time. Always a good yeah. time. <laughs> good. That's absolutely... It's, it's a good problem to have, though, isn't it? Because uh, Oh, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. Absolutely one. It's a big milestone. We're, talking, we're going to mm. talk a bit about milestones today. We and, will. Yeah. We will. But, yeah. We, you know, so what was... If you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, you know, we, we had a great, great... Um, win actually uh, i should probably shouldn't be proving this but it was around the idea of just finishing the book getting to the end of the first draft and and how we need to celebrate that but then all those little milestones that happen all the way through the journey of writing have to celebrate like whatever happened to you this week everyone somewhere made a milestone in their writing this week and you have to sometimes think a bit hard about what that is but it's brilliant when you hit those big ones and those big ones and you're sitting there waiting for an edit. That is exciting times, isn't it? It is. It is. <laughs> it's, and terrifying. But, you know, I've, I've been here a few times before. It's always good. You, you have to look at any kind of uh, constructive feedback. It's always an opportunity. I had, a, I had a meeting with a fellow screenwriter just last week with some development people about a, a screenplay we're working on. And it was really constructive. It was really, really... I know you often hear... Uh, nightmare stories about you know Hollywood script feedback you know make make everyone more likable or whatever but this was really good helpful feedback you know so I'm I I embrace it until I don't yeah it's actually <laughs> I mean it's a bigger thing isn't it though when people I know a lot of people fear putting anything out into the world because they are worried about getting that feedback but as you go through the process enough times and build those calluses and thick skins which is a, again a right of passage for every author it's a it's a it's that moment where it turns and you start to think, you know, if all feedback is useful. You can discard what doesn't doesn't work for you, but that's how we grow as authors. So it's, a, it's yeah, it's a, it's a difficult but very, very valuable part of the journey, isn't it? Now, talking of writing journeys, we have one humdinger of an interview and guest today, Mark. So tell us about the incredible Scott Churo. Well, he's a legend. Simple as that. He's an absolute legend. I mean, he's a writer and a lawyer. He's the author of uh, at least a dozen best-selling uh, novels, including including Presumed Innocent, thank you very much, a book that essentially invented the modern legal thriller. I mean, yes, we'd had, you know, l- books with lawyers and stuff before. I mean, we you know, th- th- there have been books. But this, this transformed the genre. Uh, and he's got a new novel out, Suspect, which is terrific fun. Uh, and we talk about that. Uh, he was a formal federal prosecutor. Uh, he's retired now, but he's he was also president of the Authors Guild. As a lawyer, he's devoted a lot of time to pro bono matters. He's someone who fights for the little guy all the way through. Um, so yeah, it's it, it was... This was a dream, a dream of uh, of an interview. And in fact, um, our friend Steve Kavanagh, who we mentioned briefly in the interview, and he's been on the podcast a couple of times, uh, he was on the blurb uh, of the, the 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 information sheet that I got, and he says, Scott Turo is a legend of suspense fiction and suspect is another surefire hit from the master of the legal thriller. And he sold somewhere around 30 million books. So he's, you know, so we discuss, amongst other things, Taking a supporting character from one story and putting them front and centre in their own story, why he didn't take the first offer he got for Presumed Innocent, why he thought readers would hate Presumed Innocent, and he answers a whole bunch of questions from our patrons and academies. Brilliant. So let's dive in and listen to this intriguing interview with Mark chatting with the amazing Scott Juro. Scott Juro, welcome to the bestseller experiment. How are you today, sir? I'm fine, Mark. How are you? I noticed that you've got what you'd call a jersey on, and 
Uh, so it's 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 summer over here still. So yeah, no, no, summer, summer. Yeah, we we had summer and it nearly burned us to death. And now the rain yeah, has come back with a vengeance. So yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> but right. listen, listen to get us through the dark days. I'm delighted because in my hot little hands here, I've got a copy of your new novel, Suspect, uh, and this is um. This is really exciting because there are connections to Presumed Innocent. There are characters that are returning from previous books as well. Uh, this is, uh, it, and it looks absolutely amazing. Gorgeous cover as well. Tell us about Suspect. Uh, well, my last novel, which was called The Last Trial, followed <clears throat> a character who's appeared often in my work, Sandy Stern. He was the defense lawyer for Rusty Savage and Presumed Innocent. Uh, played by Raul Julia in the movie. Uh, and uh, Sandy was at the end of his career in the last trial, literally <clears throat> trying his final case. And a character emerged unexpectedly to me, who was his granddaughter, uh, who was um, sort of a um, self-consciously eccentric human being uh, <laughs> with a you know common nail through her nose as uh, as jewelry and uh, Stern looks over to her <clears throat> at the start of the trial and is simply grateful that she's shown up uh, <laughs> because there were occasions when no matter how momentous the event, she might not be there. Uh, and uh, both readers and I loved this character, Pinky Granham, Stern's granddaughter. And I, you know, I got the idea, what would it be like to give this young woman, a novel of her own. And, uh, and, and, you know, and that's what suspect is. Uh, I, the most daunting part of it candidly was um, writing from the point of view of somebody who's 40 years younger than I am. <laughs> uh, and uh, and that, that candidly is a much bigger gap in my reckoning than gender or even sexual orientation, yeah. which uh, you know, Pinky differs from me in both regards, but uh, she's an incredibly intuitive investigator now uh, attached to the law office of another relative. Uh, and uh, together, she and uh, Rick, her boss, are charged with defending the local police chief who's been charged with extracting sexual favors from members of the police force in exchange for promotions. And the kicker uh, in suspect is that the police chief is female and the complainants are all guys. So that, that's where we start off. And Pinky's also got <clears throat> a typically um, irrational fascination with her next door neighbor about whom uh, she's got all kinds of uh, nefarious plots going in her head. He's a, he's a hit man. Uh, he's in witness protection. Uh, and, uh, despite Rick's telling her, leave the guy alone. He's somebody who wants to be left alone, leave him alone. She can't resist. So th those are the two, uh, the two, uh, stories, the A and the B story in terms that you're familiar with, Fantastic. Uh, that are per percolating. You mentioned Pinky there. As well as the the gender gap and the age gap, which I'd like to talk about in a moment, but, but the other thing is she she was a supporting character in the last trial, yeah. and supporting characters they're always fun to write because they're not carrying the weight of the story. Right. There's, there's not as <clears throat> so much consequence. Now you're putting putting her front and center. Sure. Was that how much of a challenge was that putting her uh, at the center of that story? Well, um, I don't think I would have tried it if I didn't have some instinct for who she was. And Pinky, Pinky most fundamentally is uh, a young adult who's, you know, past the experimentation of adolescence, uh, who's coming to terms with the fact that um, if, if you define normal by what most people do and want, uh, she's somebody who knows she's not normal. Um, She's uh, far less interested in finding a lifetime partner than most people seem to be. Uh, you know, she's happy being alone. She said the pandemic was a relief to her because <laughs> she didn't have to deal with other people. And uh, and I, I understood that about her 
Um, and, you know, what a poignant and sometimes unhappy struggle it is to say to yourself, uh, I'm not like other people. Other people are not always going to like me and certainly they won't understand me, but I can't shake off the fact that I am who I am. And at least I'm not trying um, to make myself fit into their expectations because mm -hmm. that'll never work. Uh, so that was my fundamental vision of the character and something that I thought I understood uh, since she appeared um, as a, you know, lesser character in, in the last trial. Forrester, you know, famously remarked that, you know, the difference between major characters and minor characters is that the minor characters, no matter how entertaining, are flat, which is to say they have no dimension, uh, whereas the major characters are round and, and do exist in three dimensions. Uh, but I, I, you know, I felt uh, three dimensions in this young woman at all times. Fantastic. Did you have to do any research? Did you do any, did you, you know, were you speaking to it? Were you going on TikTok, Scott? You know, were you, were you searching, you know, this generation, what, what, how they live and breathe? Or do you have family members that you can talk to? How did, how did you help get those three dimensions into, into Pinky? Well, I had um, both a daughter and a stepdaughter who are closer in age to Pinky. Um, one of them has <clears throat> some life experience that's a little more like Pinky's, but nothing, not, nothing really like Pinky. Um, you know, but one of them self-identifies as queer. So I could, um, you know, I could ask for her guidance. Mm. Um, so, but, you know, I don't know anybody like Pinky. I really don't. Um, you know, she's, she's really a creature of my imagination other than, you know, looking at people on the subway and going, I wonder what's going through her mind. Yeah. You know, why is she presenting that way? Uh, and what does it, you know, what does it mean to her? And, and I am thinking about those kinds of questions seriously. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I didn't think <clears throat> it, it's easy to figure out how millennials talk. Um, you know, the idiom is available, as you point out, all over the internet. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the hard part, although I was frequently corrected on, you know, subtle misuses. Uh, but, um, it, you know, there were there's there were certainly technological issues that I had to research uh, and, you know, and legal issues. And I always find research very helpful, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that your listeners might uh, find interesting because I think it gets the creative juices flowing in the sense of, okay, so there's this detail and that's how this machine works. What does that mean for my plot? What does that mean for my character? Since I always think of plot as being a species of character. So uh, if I'm stuck, I'll go do research and I find that, you know, it actually greases the machinery. I can't let that pass. Plot is a species of character. Can can you talk about that in a little more detail? Yeah, I, I, I mean, if if a work of narrative, you know, be it um, be it a novel, which is what I'm most familiar with, or a film, where I have you know passing experience you know, or I suppose an epic poem. Um, if if um, it's going to work, then what happens has to be credible, of course. And the reason it's credible is because it's consistent with the character of the principal figures in the story. Uh, so uh, now it's an advantage to write about somebody like Pinky, who is in part a mystery to herself. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's somebody with a minor criminal record as an adolescent. And, and she's incapable of fully uh, obeying the law, for example. So, you know, she does stuff like, you know, picking locks um, that uh, she knows can get her in a heap of trouble. Uh, so, you know, if I was writing about uh, 
a very staid lawyer and prosecutor that might seem um, you know more far fetched or or a deep reveal of his character but you know in with for somebody like pinky it seems fully consistent uh that uh and that she would do uh the stuff she's been told explicitly not to do uh and uh and that's what i mean by the fact that plot is a species of character you know that they are they really are one and the same if you uh, that the, the plot is the way to reveal the character of your of your principal figures. Wonderful stuff. There's a common theme through so much of your writing, which is that people have two sides. You know, they they will present something, but there'll be some other side. To them. Is that something you explore again in in Suspect as well? Oh, for sure. You know, um, I think you know one credit to Pinky is she's a lot more out there than most people. Uh, and uh, but I, I but, you know, as she says, there are things about her that people don't understand. Uh, you know, she's regarded as brash um, and uh, rude sometimes. Uh, and what she says to the readers very early on is, you know, what they don't understand is that I'm scared of most people. You know, that since she was a child, she's been anxious in the company of other human beings. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that that's but one small example of what you're talking about, that everybody always has an inner story that doesn't uh, fully meet um, expectations. You know, and of course, a lot of it has to do about, you know, the desires that are suppressed in ordinary in, in ordinary life, uh, you know, so you can go to work and, you know, not gawk at your coworker. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it, it exists at many levels, the part of us that never gets presented to others or rarely does. Mm. Let's go back to where it all started, Scott. Um, I was interested to read that, first of all, you were hooked by the Count of Monte Cristo as a child, I believe, and, yeah. and your mother wanted to be a writer as well. Yeah. So yeah. you were... It was very much in your on your in your life from an early age. Can can you talk about that? Sure. Um, you know, in many ways, the household in which I grew up was privileged uh, and prosaic, uh, in the sense that you know we, I didn't grow up in the suburbs, and but you know it was a very upper middle class neighborhood on the north side of Chicago almost exclusively Jewish. Um, and, uh, you know, my parents' ambitions for me, uh, whatever they said, were, you know, to be a doctor, which was what my father was. My dad was an OBGYN, um, you know, a baby catcher, as they, as they put it. <laughs> and, um, uh, but, you know, my dad, as it turned out, was kind of a haunted human being. His mother had died when he was five years old. Uh, serving in World War II, um, as is true of millions of others, had not done him a lot of good. Uh, it was a deeply traumatic experience to him as it was, as I said, to millions of other, particularly males uh, of his age. And he was a hard guy to live with. And, uh, you know, as a child, because I was frankly so frightened of him, I think what I said to myself is, I don't want to be like that guy. Uh, and in order to divide and conquer, I said, I'm going to be like my mom. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do what she wants to do, which is to be a writer. And I have to say, Mark, I am always, and I never can answer this enigmatic question, which is, did the desire proceed? The talent, or did I sense in myself that, yeah, I could be good at telling stories and ergo, uh, that's why I want to go in that direction. I really, I'll, I'll never know. But, you know, very early on, um, after I read The Count of Monte Cristo at the age of 10, I said, I want to be a novelist. And what I thought at that age which probably is about as valid as anything else the 10-year-olds think, uh, was that 
wow, if it's that exciting to read this book, think <laughs> about how much more exciting it must have been to feel that story come to life within yeah. yourself. Uh, and of course, what the 10 year old doesn't understand is the amount of toil and agony <laughs> along the way. That's wonderful. Let's talk about some of that toil and agony because you, um, you were studying law, uh, but you, you were writing, but you decided the writing wasn't working. So you went to law school. Is that, is that yeah. correct? Well, um, uh, I mean, the writing was not working in a way that most of your listeners will yes. <laughs> uh, instantly understand, which is I was not going to be able to make a living at it, mm -hmm. uh, at least not uh, at that moment. So I needed something else to do. And I think a lot of writers um, accept um, what's immediately at hand, whether that means working as a waiter or, in my case, uh, becoming an English professor, because by pure fortuity, I had ended up as a lecturer, the very lowest rank in the English department at Stanford. And um, I was smart enough to say, this is not the right life for me. Um, that was an estimate to some extent of my own selfishness, in the sense that I didn't take the kind of joy that a great teacher has to take from uh, his or her students' gains. Uh, it was also an estimate about the nature of academic English at that time. I saw the realist writers around Stanford in constant war with the experimentalists, the avant-gardists. And um, to me, they were, you know, fighting over a postage stamp size <laughs> piece of terrain. <laughs> And the other thing that was happening, and, and, and here is one place I give myself credit for seeing the future. Um, there was a movement afoot that seemed to be gaining hold, which was to treat the teaching of literature as being um, basically about politics. And that struck me as um, intuitively wrong. And, uh, but, and for those who go back and listen to this and say, well, I don't see anything about, you know, the Labor Party versus the conservatives <laughs> in literature. Yeah, you're, maybe not. But if you think about the extent to which identity politics dominates the current interpretation of literature, that's exactly what I was talking about. And, um, it's not that I necessarily find those strains of thought wrong, but my own view of literature is that um, people write literature because the conflicts that it expresses are not capable uh, of being reduced uh, to slogans or even, you know, theories. Uh, it's about a complex of human experience that resists easy definition. And for that reason, I thought the politicization of the teaching of literature um, was fundamentally an error, and I wanted no part of it. Right. Okay. That, so then you went to law school. And, I did. And as I understand it, you wrote Presumed Innocent while riding on the train to and from your yeah. job as an assistant attorney. Yeah. Yeah. What... What did that do to the – because I, I, I was somebody who worked and I, I wrote in my community again. A lot of listeners will be doing this. And for me, it's, um, you know, you have the small slice of time where you have to focus mm -hmm. on that and nothing else. Did that, did that sort of give the writing a sort of sense of urgency? Well, um, I had one gift, and this is where I want to go back to what I was saying to your audience earlier, which is I – of course, it's true that becoming a lawyer – provided me with what by ordinary standards is ultimately a magnificent income. But that wasn't what I was thinking about. Um, what I knew was that this, uh, the, the, the struggle that's at the heart of the law to define what is just, and in particular, um, the, the struggle that society always has to deal with transgression, which is really what the criminal law is about, that excited something, you know, fundamental in me. Um, 
And that's why I went to law school, because I was far more passionate about that than I was about, uh, you know, English criticism. Uh, and, and so, and, and that insight into myself um, was entirely correct. I <clears throat> wrote a book about being a law student that really um, was about my inner torment as a law student. Um, I'm fortunate to be far more neurotic than the average person. And therefore, you know, I had a great subject in myself. <laughs> um, and that was still going on when I started work as a federal prosecutor, you know, um, in, in Chicago, prosecuting, you know, significant crimes. Uh, and uh, so that was all boiling up in me. And the point is that just like my book about being a law student, the time I was writing on the morning commuter train was born of all of these inner struggles. And so um, what I was writing had great urgency, but not so much because of the time restraints, but because um, this was stuff I wanted to express and deal with and understand myself. Um, and, uh, you know, and a, a time was important only because there was not enough time to really, you know, linger with those, with that mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, but so I would write whatever was, you know, impelling me at the moment. Uh, and, uh, it was a bunch of, you would look at it and say disconnected, um, things, character descriptions, you know, uh, scenes, uh, settings, snappy dialogue between two people, um, character background, a lot of that. Um, that's what I was doing every morning, but not what I've been doing the morning before. And I'm always at pains to point out that had it not been for the invention of the personal computer and the encouragement that I got from, uh, you know, my ex-wife to buy that computer, uh, that, um, you know, they are, um, that, that I, w I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. So, so the, the computer enabled you to take all these, these right. scattering thoughts and put them into one place and start shaping them yeah. into, yeah. into... Exactly, exactly. Into presumed innocent, which let's stop and talk about that because it is a phenomenon, uh, frankly. I... I I was a bookseller. I remember it coming out. It was, um, you know, it was an amazing book. What I didn't know, I've read you, you know, it went to publishers, it went to auction, you got offers, but you didn't just take the first offer. As I understand it, you asked each of the editors how they could improve the book. Yeah. yeah. Tell us, tell us more about that. Well, um, and, uh, you know, I had the fact that I, got divorced speaks volumes, but there was a part of my first marriage that was very good. And that was the degree to which uh, my ex really uh, believed in me as a writer. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, much more so than as a lawyer, she hated lawyers. She hated the law. She hated me for being a lawyer. <laughs> and, uh, but when this began to happen, she said to me, as long as I've known you, you've had a dream. Why not have all of it? And um, and so that meant getting the kind of editorial attention uh, that seemed most congruent with my own ambitions for the book. Uh, and uh, ultimately, the editor I chose, Jonathan Galassi, who went on to become the editor in chief and then the publisher at the little U.S. house of Ferris, Strauss, and Giroux, one of the most esteemed publishing houses we have on this side of the pond. Um, Jonathan's fundamental vision as, a, as an editor was completely consistent with mine, which is, and, and this is his genius as an editor, which was being able to look at a book and say, how can I make this book the best book that the author intended to write? Um, you have you have editors uh, who are inspired, uh, but often want you to write the book that they see in your work. Mm 
mm. uh, the book that they would write if they had, you know, either the time or the talent or whatever is holding them back from doing that. That is not, that's not Jonathan. Uh, and what I, again, I knew nothing about having an editor, except that the first editor I'd have had, um, really didn't, he wasn't interested in any of those questions his <laughs> questions were things like remind me why did i ever want to buy this book and things like <laughs> oh, <laughs> things, inspirational things like, things like that so um i i knew i didn't want to repeat that experience so uh, and i asked each of the each of the people who wanted to buy Presumed Innocent, what would you do with this book? And there were, you know, there were great answers, you know, Catherine Court, who went on to, to become uh, the, you know, publisher of uh, Penguin, Viking Penguin here in the, here in the U.S. And as a tremendous editor in person, you know, gave me a really great response as did Jonathan. And there were a couple others that I, I didn't think of uh, as being, you know, close to my vision for the book but you know it was it, it was the guidance that said um you know try to get everything you want you've finally after you know literally decades of struggle about to have the opportunity to get it so try to get it all mm. fantastic i was um i was reading somewhere that your big concern with Presumed Innocent is that you thought it might be too literary for the mystery crowd and maybe too commercial for the literary crowd. Right. But I think what you did there, and I, I was talking to our friend Steve Kavanagh, the, the uh -huh. writer, who, uh -huh. who, who give, who's Perfect given you a writer. quote for Suspect. He's, we love him to bits. He says, Scott, Scott Turo is a legend of suspense fiction. Suspect is another surefire hit from the master of the legal thriller. And I was chatting to him before we were recording, and he said, you know, Scott really is the genesis of the modern legal thriller. You were doing something different here. It didn't fit in, into any particular, you know, uh, space in the market at the time. So you, you, that that concern of yours, did you have any idea that you were kind of inventing something new? Well, um, most of the time, my predominant concern was the one you were talking about, which is um, there. There are just the world is full of people who will hate this book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, but every now and then, you know, I'd get swept away, swept away with the vision of, you know, its potential popularity and, um, you know, and I, I, my ambition at that time, because I'd been a prosecutor was to become a federal judge. And, you know, I'd write most of the day that the summer I took away from the law to finish presumed innocent. And I went and. I'd go out and play basketball with myself, which is the only way I've ever been able to win. And, um, <laughs> you know, I came in and I was showering and I suddenly had this vision. Oh, my God, you know, it's going to be a huge bestseller and it's going to be a movie. And, and little voice said, well, if that happens, you'll never become a federal judge. And I thought about it for a second. And I said, well, OK, well, I'll make that deal. You know, I'll give, I'll give up that <laughs> ambition in favor of the larger and older one um, again. A, a wise deal, as it turned out. Well, indeed. It was 45 weeks on the New York Times bestseller charts. Uh, in that period, it sold 645,000 copies. It was a movie with Harrison Ford, which, again, amazing movie. Um, uh, I mean, I know everyone talked about Harrison Ford's haircut at the time, yeah. uh, which, um, which, which I thought was such a clever move, actually, because up to then, he'd only played heroes, and the right. haircut was a great signal. You were thinking, mm, did he do it? Did he do it? And, and, it and, that, and that was all Harrison. Right. He was the one who made he was the one who made that decision. You know, and he's a very canny um and and deep uh talent. Mm. Uh and uh, but he he's the one who said, you know, I'm gonna cut off my hair uh yeah. and you know look a little more like Joe Sixpack. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and, you know, and what that said is this is a guy from a working class background who's acquired all of this power, but hasn't forgotten where it came from. Mm. That's a fantastic choice. But now, Presumed Innocent is, has been adapted into an Apple TV Plus yeah. series. 
Right. Apple TV Plus are making some of the best shows out there at the moment, as far as I'm concerned. So this is very, very exciting. I guess you can't tell us too much about that, or, or how much can you can you tell us? <laughs> well, I know you know this, Mark, but uh, I can't tell you too much because, of course, the last person to know is the author. Yes. Uh, and, and that, by the way, does not mean that I'm being treated with utter disregard by uh, the people from Bad Robot, J.J. Abrams shop, shop or or they, my friend David Kelly, uh, who's the principal writer. Um, you know, they're they're huge talents. They've got incredibly busy lives, uh, and uh, you know they don't get on the phone or send me emails all that often. Yeah. So, do I know what's going on right now with the casting of? Uh, of the new presumed innocent? Yes, I do. Uh, and am I free to tell you? No, I'm not. Although, <laughs> I <had> to ask. <laughs> I, I wish I understood why they're so reticent about saying this. Um, but I think Apple wants the cast set and then wants to make uh, a single announcement rather than dribbling out the news. Yeah, that makes but, sense. That uh, makes sense. I do know it's going to be filmed in LA. I do know they hope to start in January. Um, you know, it'll be eight parts. Uh, and I can tell you that the pilot script, which David sent me months and months ago, um, you know, really lifted the top of my head off because right. as I told him, uh, and this is, you know, part of the guy's genius. I said, it shocked even me, the end of, <laughs> and, the end of you know, the pilot. Uh, and that's some feat, you know, when you're, talking to the guy who took the first pass at creating all the characters. That's so. a very good sign. That's a very good sign. Scott, I have a few listener questions if you've got time sure. for those. So uh, uh, Laura Shepard has a couple of questions. How do you make courtroom scenes exciting? And how do you find drawing a line between what actually happens in real life and what is entertaining? And I, I know Laura works in the legal profession in the UK. So very mm -hmm. aware of very often what you see in movies and TV shows, right. surprise right. witnesses, all that kind of thing, generally doesn't happen yeah. in the real legal system. So how do you make those scenes exciting and, and how do you balance reality and, and wanting to entertain the reader? Well, again, I don't know which part of the legal world Laura works in. Um, my view of the courtroom always was that it was a fundamentally exciting place. Uh, and, and to some extent, it's like being a police officer. They always say that being a cop, you know, is a life of absolute boredom relieved by moments of total terror. And, um, you know, being a trial lawyer involves a lot of slogging and tedium uh, as you fight about, you know, the rules and, um, you know, evidence and all the rest of it, but I never lost the sense that what was happening in the courtroom, at least when I was trying criminal cases, was of immense significance. Mm -hmm. uh, I was lucky enough to, you know, have major cases, uh, and in their own small way, each of those cases was literally going to change the life of the community I lived in. Not to mention the life of the person who was, you know, being judged. So to me, it was always basically exciting. And, uh, you know, so what I think of myself as doing is cutting out uh, the tedious gaps in between. Uh, yeah. But, you know, every, every trial, I, I never was at, I never tried a case um, either in, as a prosecutor, or even when I got into civil practice, when I finally left the U.S. Attorney's Office, that did not have its surprising moments. Right. And, um, you know, the first case I tried in private practice, someone, I don't know who, um, passed uh, a sheaf of documents to, to my associate who was sitting next to me at the time. And, you know, she started looking through them and realized that uh, everything the plaintiffs were saying in this case was being contradicted by the papers in her hand. And wow. she's, you know, elbowing me, Lisa's, you know, 
<laughs> trying to get my attention and, you know, just <laughs> ask for a continuance so we can look at this stuff. And I was kind of annoyed with her. But but the point is, you know, if that happened in a novel, you'd say, well, who, who came up with those papers? And we need to know. And what, you know, what was her motive? And uh, I can't answer those questions. I don't know who decided to betray the plaintiff. But I will tell you that it it functionally ended the lawsuit. You know, we won a resounding judgment in our favor. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and if I tell you what it was about, you know, it's a clash between two insurance companies. You'd say, wow, that, you know, what could be more boring? And <laughs> and yet that was an incredibly dramatic moment. Yeah. So uh, if, if you separate the wheat from the chaff, Laura, I think. I think any case has got its potential. Fantastic. Great answer. Thank you. Tracy Montague has a question. Says, Does Scott ever get over the fear that he, he can't write or that the next book is no good? I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Do you, how do you approach the beginning of each book? Is there a fear there? Is that something you have to overcome? Um, yes. And I am long reconciled to the fact that I can't be young again. And so... When you talk to me about the innovations of presumed innocent, um, I, I, I understand what you're talking about. Uh, and, you know, the sense that I was walking across shifting ground um, was terrific, but also really frightening. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's easier being more experienced. Um, but it's harder because you can't reinvent yourself. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I wrote a book like Suspect principally because I hadn't written about anybody like Pinky right. before. And I wanted, you know, the challenge of, you know, reaching out a couple of generations. So, uh, and, but I do that, you know, because of the, you know, the, the, the questions that, that your listener is asking. And, uh, you know, the fear at, at an age like mine is that, you know, this isn't any good um, because it's not original, that I'm engaged in, you know, imitating myself, which is, if that's what happens, it's time to quit. Mm. Very good. I've got a Chris, quick question from Christopher Wills. Uh, it says you have a busy life and career. This is your, you know, legal work has been ongoing. Yeah. So, what brings you back to fic fiction? Is it sort of a cathartic release from from your other work? I, that's a great question uh, and a very smart one. Um, and you know, I retired from the practice of law two years ago. Um, I still have two lingering cases which end up preoccupying me. Um, you know, I was working on one of them with my assistant for a few minutes all today. Um, and yes, I mean, even when my life was consumed by practice, as I was explaining before about my work on the morning commuter train, mm. there was something deeply cathartic about being able to transform my daily experience and my, you know, my woes and anger and anguish. Uh, into fiction. Uh, and so uh, the short answer to Christopher's question is, you got it, man. That's correct. <laughs> excellent. Excellent answer. I'd like to talk about some of your other work as well, because not many people will necessarily know this, but you were president of the Authors Guild. I think you did yeah. two two terms yeah. as president, uh, where you fought you know, for writers to receive fair payment for their work. You targeted issues such as intellectual property rights, ebook piracy. Yeah. A lot of those challenges are still with us. What sort of challenges do you see writers facing in the future? Uh, they're um, they're countless, um, and you know the the challenges that authors face now are not the same as when I started my career. But to to be brief about it, um, you have a landscape that is increasingly dominated by um, corporate behemoths, mm -hmm. which are also significant innovators, and they're changing the terrain so that Amazon, for example, is somebody I've picked on a lot. 
Um, Amazon, one, one of the publishers remarked to me at one point, Amazon wants to get rid of everybody who stands between the reader and them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's completely true. Mm -hmm. They want to get rid of your editor. They want to get rid of your publisher. Uh, they want it to be, you know, they'll publish your book, they'll put it up, and then being Amazon, they'll squeeze you however they can uh, to make themselves more profitable and you less. Uh, and that's equally true of uh, companies like Google. Um, you know, Google is fundamentally involved in the business of using other people's copyrighted work um, without payment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes they get caught at it. Most of the time they don't. Uh, when it's your work that they're sampling uh, this way, it can be pretty vexing um, because it's, it's, it's not scholarship. They're doing it to make money. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, every time somebody clicks, on the little snippet from your work, uh, Google's making money and you're not. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, the authors need to get over the fear of saying, uh, I want to make a living from this yeah. because uh, I, I'm always at a pains to point out that I am not crusading for myself. People who are lucky enough to call themselves best-selling authors do not need a hand. Mm -hmm. uh, what I am concerned about is the shrinking ground for the so-called mid-list author yeah. uh, who finds it harder and harder to make a living this way. And as much as my personal sympathies are engaged from my many friends who fall into that category, I am concerned about the culture as a whole. Mm -hmm. The fewer voices, the poorer the culture is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why copyright exists to make sure that writers have an independent source of income that doesn't depend on the largesse of patrons or the government. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you for fighting the good fight on behalf of all the authors listening. Lastly, Scott, you were in the rock bottom remainders band with Stephen <laughs> King, Dave Barry, yeah. Amy Tan. What is it about writers wanting to be in rock, wanting to be rock stars? Well, why do lawyers want to be novelists? I mean, uh, <laughs> and, and, and besides, you tell me who doesn't want to be a rock star. <laughs> it's who, true. Who, Fair who, who, isn't, who isn't in the showers, you know, singing into the nozzle when nobody can hear them? So uh, it is one of the most ridiculous things um, in my life. Adrian and I were listening the other day in the car, you know, all of a sudden feel a whole lot better by the birds came on. And I looked at her and I said, do you know how stupid and ridiculous it is that I have stood next to Roger McGuinn singing this song? No way. It's preposterous. <laughs> no, no, no talent bum like me is up there next to a genius like Roger. But that's the rock bottom remainders. And it's uh, what a gas. I mean, it's, it's, you know, some of them are really good musicians. I'm not, and therefore it's even more fun for me. <laughs> I meant to ask, what do you play? I sing. I yeah, sing. Excellent. As I say, I sing in the key of H. So <laughs> fantastic. Listen, folks, the suspect is out there now. Grab your copy and dip into all of Scott's work. It's an amazing, amazing body of work. Scott, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today and hope to speak to you again soon. Mark, thank you very much. Your interview was as good and searching as I was told it was going to be. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft, and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. That's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. 
Oh, I think we all need just to stop and take a breath there. There was so much <laughs> to good stuff, so much to take in. And, and, you know, coming out of that interview, one thing we know for sure is Scott is not just a powerhouse of an author. He is a powerhouse of a thinker, of a, you know, this the, the depth at which his mind works must have felt like you were going in the ring with a heavyweight there, Mark. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Well, you know, I, do, I don't think so because I think the really smart people don't wear it on their sleeve. They never yeah. make you feel small. It was, it was a lovely conversation. It was very relaxed. He was very, um, uh, you know, nimble, obviously, you know, great, like you said, great thinker, but uh, he's he never, he you know, I, whenever we talk to a big name like this, I do get a little nervous, a little fretful that they might be a bit full of themselves. Couldn't be further from the truth. Just yeah. a complete gent and, um, you know, a, a lifetime of experience there. And there's, I've listened back to this interview three times now, and every time I, I find something different. So it's, it's one of these we're going to be coming back to again and again, I think. Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. And I think um, I – so it, we were saying that often, you know – to, to be able to take all of that, those ideas and knowledge and storytelling and put that into words is one thing, but to be able to express it through, you know, words in an interview, you know, Scott has that breadth of experience, obviously. I mean, you can see, you know, as well, how, you know, how he was drawn to become a lawyer as well. I mean, his incredible kind of ability to kind of express the spoken word is, is brilliant, but let's dive in. There's so much to discuss about Scott's interview. The one thing that jumped out straight off the bat was this idea of promoting minor characters, and mm. I guess this is a this is a, 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 a gift that authors can do when they've they've written a number of different books, um, and it's quite a common thing, isn't it, Mark? I think in in, in kind of prolific authors. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating thing. I mean, if you've got a long running series, and he's built this whole universe. One of the things we we didn't get round to talking about is he's created a fictional precinct for his stories. It's a place called Kindle County, which is a kind of fictional county in 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 the Chicago area. And we never really got into that. But like Stephen King, Stephen King's Maine is his own fictional thing. You know, the um, uh, Castle Rock and that all that kind of thing. It's his own fictional place. So you create your own little universe he was doing it years before you know marvel cinematic universe made it fashionable again you know this idea that you've got these characters who move in and out of various stories and every now and then you can bring one of them in the background to the forefront and that's uh it's such a treat but it is it's you know, he he uh, he was quoting. I think he was quoting C.S. Forrester when he said, "Minor characters are flat, major characters are round." Uh, so you know, you can bring those. But he, every now and then, you find someone in the background. You think they're really interesting. I'd love to. I'd love to give them more to do. And I'm, you know, I'm four books into a series, and I've got characters. I'm thinking, yeah, let's let's have a bit more fun with them. Uh, and it's the challenge is. As I said in the interview, you know, if they're in the background in someone else's story, you can have lots of fun with them because there's there's not as much consequence. But once you bring them front and center, then they have this big journey of change that they have to go on. And you have to have a beginning, a middle and an end. And you're testing in, in a way they've not been tested before. And that's the challenge. And, and will the character stand up to that kind of scrutiny? And I think with, with Pinky and certainly reading the reviews, Pinky has been a huge focus of the reviews and people are loving seeing Pinky come back and uh, become, you know, this, uh, this, this protagonist uh, with, a, with a story in her own right. So it um, won't always work, but in this case, it, it, I think it has. Yeah, and I think also it's really important for everyone to remember that you know as you as you start out writing a new book and you you've, you've got your main character and you're focusing on developing that character, it's always worth remembering that one of the gifts of writing the story is you don't quite know who's going to show up and mm. not necessarily steal the show, but become this intriguing character that firstly you maybe are love and you think oh there's so much more I could do with him or her versus also the feedback from authors because scott even referenced that you know that that authors often are surprised or they or their their ideas are equal by by feedback of like oh we love this character and you hear that enough times as an author and it, it starts to sow the seed doesn't it and you start thinking maybe, maybe i could do something like that and the other thing i love about this idea is that unlike where you're starting a brand new book and you're trying to start a character from scratch you kind of get to play with a minor character in a in a story and kind of get to 
kind of get to hang out with them a bit before you actually throw them in as a main character in the story. And so in many ways, you're in a major advantage of being able to start with a character that you've already kind of given a bit of backstory to, you've kind of lived with for a bit. And I think that they can become really strong characters because of that kind of nurturing that you've done early on with them. Yeah, try before you buy. It's, um, <laughs> well, it's, it's also like, um, it's like rehearsal. You know, before you go on stage, you have weeks and weeks of rehearsal and you can try different things out and you you, you will discover things about the character that uh, you would never get just from, you know, looking at the page. So once you get a character on their feet and have them move around and and do things and if you're doing that in the story you you, you realize actually there's 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 more i can do with this i can i can actually you know so you you keep them you don't let them take over the show if they're if they're a supporting character in your protagonist story the worst thing you do is have them barge in and start taking over i think that's the wrong time to do it maybe further down the line you could think yeah you know what i could could be a short story could be a whole novel could be a little novella off to the side or whatever so you do you do see that quite a bit and it's a great and as you say that that thing of reader feedback which is such a great privilege for published authors is you will always be surprised by the things that readers enjoy about your books because sometimes it's just a throwaway line or, or a character or a location something resonates with them that you could never have dreamed of and that's that that is such a thrill mm. because it's evidence of you know we've talked about this before you know once you've written the book you're handing it over to the reader it's theirs now and it's evidence of that thing coming to life in their mind in a way that you could not have imagined uh and that's is, that's is so exciting yeah that's brilliant now another thing that scott talked about was um, and we've talked about research in so many different forms you know the good side of research the bad side of research the the dangers the pitfalls the benefits but this is something again i'd never heard an author say before, which I love, this idea that research can be used to get creativity flowing. And it's very, it's obvious now when you say it out loud. And I remember when, when we were writing Back to Reality, you know, the, the, the little discoveries you'd find through research would often sometimes take the story in a completely different route. But I love the fact that Scott embraces research as something to use at times when we hit those dry spells as authors or we, we, we don't quite know where to go next. It's, it's a great alternative to sitting there and staring at a blank page, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, some, it's a source of inspiration as well as just facts, facts and knowledge and, and you know, checking, checking facts or checking historical details or, or whatever it might be. You can, you can definitely be inspired by that. Uh, I mean, I, I tend to do my research after the first draft. So I will have resources that I want to go and look up gaps in my knowledge, little things I want to go back to. But you've got to be open to surprises too. You've got to be open to the idea that you'll come across something you thought, well, I never knew that. And I'm definitely putting that in the book. And that happens to me all the time, all the time. So yeah, have those, have that radar on. And it's always, it's it will always reward, I think. Yeah. And I think the thing we have to recognize as well as authors is generally we love to learn new things and research builds builds our own kind of view of the world and helps us to kind of gain empathy for these different characters that we're trying to write. And yet there is a danger, isn't there? There's always that danger with research that the research becomes the fascination and we get so lost and deep in it that we, we have to pull ourselves out of it in order to get back to the story and then try not to put everything we found <laughs> in our research yeah. into the story, yeah. as Michelle Paver told us, right? Yeah, exactly. But also, real life is always much, much weirder than fiction. You know, you'll, you'll discover things about the real world that you would never have been able to dream up, but suddenly that's reality's gift to you as an author. You think, wow, okay, let's roll with that. Let's let's run with that and see if, see if it works as part of a narrative. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm always open for that. Absolutely. Now let's talk about what liter literature and the politicization of literature. That was that's a yeah, big this, area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How long have you got? Um, I mean, it's it was it was really interesting because I've said on here on the podcast several times. I've said all writing is political uh, because you are showing your, you know, if you're 
if you're a truthful writer, if you if you're if you're speaking from your heart and your mind, and and your the writing is truthful, it's about you saying to the world, "This is how I see the world. These are my rights. These are my wrongs. These are the things I believe. These are the things that I find repellent." And you mix them all up into a story, and you challenge these ideas. You challenge your characters with the, these ideas. So, but I think there is a particularly. Um, Twitter, social media, there is this kind of politicization where people are going, hey, the, you know, and he was talking things about like like you know, uh, gender identity and things like this where you feel, okay, I'm, I've got 100, what was it, 260 characters or whatever it is on in Twitter. I've got to, you know, show the world what I think about this thing in, in this tiny little space. Uh, and there is a feeling that among authors – a pressure to almost put that into your fiction as well, but you're talking about two massively different forms, uh, where you know you've got social media, which is brief and fleeting and knee jerk, and very little thought goes into it, and then you got a novel where you might spend eight, nine, ten months a year or longer thinking about these ideas. So I, I think he's right. I mean, he said, you know, the conflicts in fiction cannot be reduced to slogans and theories. That's the thing I think all writers should take away from this. That if you're coming, if you've got, you know, an idea for a book, a central dramatic argument, a character that has been inspired by something you saw on social media or one of these issues that you want to discuss, you'll be doing that character and that issue a disservice if you do it as a slogan, as a theory, as a quick knee-jerk reaction. You have to dig deeper. You have to dig deeper, which is why you need to do that due diligence. You know, you need to... Um, you need to do the research. You need to speak to people uh, who you know live in that world or, or have experience of, of that situation. You can't just reduce it to a Twitter post. So I think, um, I mean, he was talking about the teaching of it. I think that's always been the case, you know, particularly in university. You want to provoke debate in university, and you take the the debates of the day, the hot topics of the day, and you discuss them, and everyone gets very cross. Uh, you know, but I think when you're doing a novel, you 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 have to take the time to to do it properly, and that that fascinated me. And I think um, I think the problem is when you see these things on social media, people will go, "Oh, does that mean I can't talk about this subject? Does that mean yes, I can't do, I can't, I can't and, go anywhere near this." And, and specifically, and no, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah and specifically because so many people, and we hear about it almost weekly on Twitter, so many people get into trouble for a line that they've posted and we can i mean we could name names obviously but everyone knows oh, yeah. all the type of peoples that and you, you know everywhere from our local community of people friends and family to to like people on the on the international stage and i think the challenge with that is they might be making a very important statement or they might be making a very valid statement um or they might be completely off the charts you know depending on where anyone comes from when they read it but the point is is that when you when you reduce it to a one liner, yeah. it doesn't give. Like you say, it's the wrong. It's not the wrong platform necessary to do it. But you, if you've written a book on it and you're quoting something you've written in your book, then fair enough. And then people can go and kind of read the context and why you're saying that. Mm -hmm. But it makes me appreciate the value of the novel as a, or and even nonfiction. We can't, we've got to include nonfiction in this as well yep. as a place to develop these ideas. Yep. 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 A, a debate them, think deeply about them, put forward your, your points of view and have discussions around it. Yeah. And you can't have a you can't have a discussion about major issues in many ways. Um you know on Twitter without it no. without it getting into it's, some kind it's of the worst environment. forum ever. It is I've stopped I mean I you know if you go back and look at old tweets so you know I would have yeah down with this up with that rah 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 I've stopped it. In fact, I went back and paid a service to delete about 12 years of tweets <laughs> because wow. I, I remember someone someone liked a tweet I made about eight years ago and it was really snarky. And I thought, you know what? I would never post that now. I would mm. never, ever post that now. And and Twitter is the worst forum possible for a grown-up debate. So I've just stopped putting that stuff out there. Mm. I'll put stuff about my writing um, and, you know, my life, but Anything political, I've just I've just stopped because not because I don't want to talk about it. I do, but social media is the worst place to discuss it, and so there's there's just no point. It's not a place for grown up conversation. It's you know it's great for sharing stuff about you know my writing and 
trailers and getting excited about stuff, but but not for not for the real world. Yeah, and I think I think it can be good for signposting people. You know, it can be good to signpost people to an article you've written on a blog yeah, about yeah. that. So, but but mm-hmm. it's that idea of in isolation. It, it absolutely you know is asking for trouble. On a completely different note, on a lighter note. <laughs> We, we've we been developing in the academy this idea of author milestones and we talked about at the beginning of this at the beginning of the show about the idea of like all of these different things that would be amazing to I know add. where and you're we, going with this and, I know right, where you're and, going <laughs> and, and, and the way this kind of started out as we started thinking about you know you've got to you've got to celebrate all the small things and we've done all the obvious things you know the, all the journey of the writer all the milestones we have to hit as a writer but then recently we had uh, this idea of um, you know wouldn't it be funny if somebody showed up at a book signing uh, dressed as a character in your book and we started thinking okay there's some really kind of interesting off off the wall type milestones that we should all have as authors and today i would like to add a new one <laughs> i mean this idea of what is it the rock bottom remainders that scott is in i mean I, I i probably everyone's or most people have heard of this insane kind of band that have come together and it's also happened in the acting world as well i think there's a kind of an equivalent of the author's band in the well there's quite a few actually actors uh, actresses have got together in bands but this got it's got to be this has got to be a milestone after the pulitzer prize i think don't you think yeah absolutely i mean there's there's a british alternative as well there's the fun loving crime writers which is val mcdermott luca vesti uh chris brookmeyer and a f- and a few other authors <clears throat> um uh Mark Billingham's in there as well I think oh, and a few wow. others so you know the uh, and um I know Joanne Harris is in a prog rock band you know I was I, I was talking to her before I interviewed her you know she's she's in a band you know where they got a mellotron and everything so yeah there is de- it's definitely a goal it's definitely a goal <laughs> and I think it's um I mean you look if you're watching us on YouTube folks you look behind Mr D there's a keyboard well, and guitar yeah, you look behind me there's a couple of guitars there you know we're all Scott's, Scott's completely right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. And I think you, you have every right. If you if you sell a few million books, you have absolutely every right to set your own band up. And uh, definitely, you know, I mean, it certainly makes for interesting book signings. I'm sure. <laughs> People moshing in front of the table with yeah. all your books. Oh, there, he's got but... his guitar out again. Oh God, oh, there we go. Fantastic. <laughs> but yeah. So anyway, we want to know from you folks uh, along this line as a bit of fun. What other author milestones should we add to this list, which are a little bit off the wall? So tell us if you maybe you've done one. Maybe you've maybe you've been a part of some interesting experiment yourself, uh, which has been an offshoot of your writing. But let us know because we'd like to share and, and have some fun with those on the show as well. Now, as always, Mark. That there is so much more. There is so much more that we can talk about. So if you're interested in listening to the extended version of this podcast, uh, Mark and I are going to dive into the species of the character that Scott talked about. We're going to talk about why why sometimes it's great to do the opposite of what one of your parents did. Um, <laughs> the excitement of reading versus the thrill of writing. Uh, and also we're going to dive into editorial feedback and the importance of finding the right editor. And also um, this idea of authors needing to get over this fear of making a living for themselves. That in itself is worth the price of admission. So please yes. come and join us on Patreon. Uh, come and come and sign up and support this podcast and get an extra, and yeah, who knows, Mark, it could be what? 15 minutes it could be half well, an gonna, hour last could week be talking about, could be talking about amazon so it could be, could be going for <laughs> could quite be a, a while could be quite yeah. an extended episode so anyway come and join us if you'd like to if you'd like to deep dive with us on all of that um just pop along to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support so mark what's been going on this week in social media with wins social media has been uh, some lovely news. Uh, first of all, James Sharp on the uh, BXP group, he said, I've had rather a good couple of weeks and I've signed with Ollie Munson at AM Heath and I'm enthusiastically work- working on some suggested edits on my book. So I officially have an agent. Woohoo! Oh, James, congrats, man. Huge, Brilliant. huge congrats. Massive. Really, really big news. Uh, so really happy for James there. And it's great. Whenever anyone in the Academy or the bestseller uh, group on Facebook, you know, which is uh, uh, one of the things you get when you join us on patreon look at the different tiers and all the all the cool stuff you get top tier get in that group it's a fantastic group of people um over on twitter andrea j skinner who is one of these people every single day andrea's there 200 words a day challenge and you know we say hello every day uh she's always you know always banking those words that's fantastic and andrea just a few days ago now we're writing this 
as um, Hurricane Ian hurtles towards Florida, and I hope right. all of our listeners and everyone out there is is safe. Um, but Andrea said uh, just a few days ago, uh, I wrote 512 words today. Now to batten down the hatches in preparation for Hurricane Fiona. So she says, my laptop is charged, so I'll get my word count in tomorrow morning, but I don't expect to have power. I'll touch base once reconnected. Well, I'm happy to report Andrea did touch base. So, folks, you know... Um, Hang in there. We got, you know, it's hurricane season, so batten down the hatches, stay safe. Uh, and um, yeah, if you can get those words in, why not? But um, yeah. I tell you what, Mark, what I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Like, because we've been living, like, living through this with some friends we've got over in East East Canada who were literally yeah, yeah. having, you know, hoping their roof wouldn't be blown away. Yeah. But I've got to say, salute Andrea for the fact that she has prepared everything she can for the hurricane and but also charged her laptop so she can get in her words if the power yeah, goes yeah. out. I mean, that is like over and above the call of duty, Andrew, but really unbelievable yeah. dedication and, 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 you know, unbelievable. And we're, we're glad that, and, and obviously thinking of everyone out there who's affected by this incredible um, storms that have been hitting them. But uh, yeah, if maybe writing is a way of kind of taking away some of the distractions or, or writing out the fear of those things that are happening in real life. Brilliant. And, yeah. uh, you know, we salute you for doing that. We really do. And finally, um, Kate Baker on the Academy. She she put in the wins. We have a Share Your Wins forum on the Academy. She says, I can no longer hide behind the vague blasé, yes, I'm working on a novel. She said, because the book's title has gone live on the publisher's books page, amongst others awaiting a cover. But you can see the release date and my name and the blurb. Yikes. Now, let's just step back from that. It is such a thrill to see that when it first feeds out and goes out to retailers and goes out to, you know, on your publisher's website, it suddenly feels really, really real, uh, especially if you're still in the middle of edits, which 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 Kate is in. Um, so, yeah, congratulations on the cake. She says, suffice to say, um, even I even have my edits uh, back to do now. I've avoided looking at them for two days. That's normal, right? Uh, anyway, here's the link if you fancy taking a pee at what is, in essence, nothing yet, but it's been made real for me. No longer just an idea, a notion of something which may exist. It is happening so i'm going to put that link in the show notes so you can check it out it's uh it's a book called made of steel which i've had the pleasure of reading and it's absolutely cracking so kate huge congrats on that brilliant and in a future episode i think we're going to read out kate's bio because it's probably the funniest it's most bio, self, it? self-deprecating <laughs> bio i've ever read and it's brilliant and it's a, it's a it's one of those buys when you read it you think yeah every author should look at this and, and you know work work theirs around some of this because it's absolutely classic absolutely brilliant brilliant stuff kate and well done and yeah to everyone else if you've if you've got any big wins if there's anything that's happening in your world which you want us to celebrate with you no matter how big or small it might be just drop us a note go to the uh, website bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash newsletter uh, to sign up and you can just reply to that newsletter or you can just get to us through the contact form on the website as well yeah, drop us a line. Go to bestsellerexperiment.com as a contact form there. Or you can find us on social media. We're on Bestseller Experiment on Facebook and at Bestseller XP on Twitter and Instagram. And if you've enjoyed the show, if you've been inspired by Scott, uh, subscribe, rate, review, wherever you get your podcast. Give us a rating. It always helps, makes us look more visible and helps us inspire more writers. Absolutely. And don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube if you enjoy watching the two of us on screen. And don't forget, folks, if you want to get the writing habit of a lifetime, then the 200 word challenge is for you. If you pop over to 200wordchallenge.com, it's our free challenge to get you writing. See if you can beat your daily streaks. See if you can keep going. And just a quick reminder of how, I mean, we've talked about this a few weeks ago, but like we've got one one of our uh, one of our kind of 200 word challenges mark hood has just done a thousand day streak which is pretty mm-hmm. bonkers but then we also had um, morgan delaney who actually wrote over a million words since starting <laughs> the challenge so just to warn you as well if you're thinking of getting involved these things can result in some seriously seriously massive amounts of word count so you have been <laughs> warned and if you'd like to also find out more about the bestseller academy that we often talk about please pop along to academy.bestsellerexperiment.com join the waiting list to find out when the next opening is mr stay i hope you have a great week this week have you got anything interesting coming up this week i do um and i don't think i'm allowed to talk about it 
Excellent. That's, That's what we like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Always leave it on a cliffhanger. That's what they say at the end of every chapter. And so on that note, I'm going to say it's a goodbye from Mark 1. And a goodbye from Mark 2. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.